Hi, everyone. This is going to be fun. We have a, a big reveal coming up, <laughs> a big, uh, big news. But uh, before we go into that, why don't uh, both of you start by kind of a, a quick intro and, and also talk a little bit about what your companies do. Thank you, Ricardo. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Hani Ogundei. I'm the CEO and founder of Edukoya. We're an online technology company uh, building the future of education for the next generation of Africans. We connect uh, learners, mostly students in K-12, to teachers for real-time online education. It's great to be here. Hi, my name is Babs Ogundei. Um, maybe the big reveal, there's a clue there. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of CUDA. We're a digital bank and um, we're on a mission to provide financial services um, to a large um, underserved market. Um, that's basically all Africans on the planet. And we want to provide uh, affordable and accessible financial services to them. Uh, we launched in 2019 and to date um, we've grown to almost 7 million customers, um, mainly in our, in our launch country in Nigeria. Um, yeah, and super excited to, to be on Slush stage, my first time. Great. So let's go straight into the most interesting question. You're, uh, you're both successful founders, you run uh, successful companies, uh, you're very busy, you work very hard, <laughs> and you're also husband and wife. So how's the, how's the marriage been since you embarked on your entrepreneurial journey? I'll let Babs go first. <laughs> um, I mean, I think there are lots of positives. Um, obviously, you know, having a partner that understands the very gruesome journey um, that the startup is, uh, you know, the late nights, early mornings, long hours. Uh, so I think in that respect, it's, it, it's a huge ad ad advantage. And it's kind of like having also like a free co-founder, you know, without having to give up you know, a lot of shares, <laughs> you know, someone to always advise you and, and help, you know, al along the journey. So I think there are lots of positives. Um, maybe you can talk about some of the challenges. Yeah, I have no problems talking about challenges. <laughs> um, I think building a startup is, is very hard um, and, and it, it can be incredibly lonely. You have this sort of big vision of what you're trying to build and oftentimes you need to work at an incredible pace. Um, so I think having, you know, a partner that understands what that feels like and can share in part of that journey has been incredibly helpful. On the other side, it can be incredibly challenging because it's two people literally obsessed with their businesses and their visions. And so it's oftentimes about striking the right balance between prioritizing work and this incredible mission that we're trying to build and also finding time to still be able to connect. So this is obviously not a therapy session, so, yes, let's, so let's, let's move on. Let's leave it like that, <laughs> and uh, let's talk a little, little bit about business. Uh, you uh, both started the company uh, before, slightly before or during COVID. Yeah. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about how, how that's been kind of from, a, from an African perspective, because obviously globally, COVID had a huge impact on uh, adoption uh, of a lot of kind of tech businesses. Um, what, what was that like in, in a place like Nigeria? Yeah, so my, my business idea actually came from COVID. So we run, in, um, during the COVID, I think around the world, education was one of the most impacted sectors, mm -hmm. particularly for young learners. Um, whereas in markets like Europe, there were lots of online options. Uh, in Nigeria at the time, schools and students and parents were really struggling. So the early foundation of the idea for Edukoya came out of that period. Um, I think what it has done for online technology company, um, education companies in particular is that it made it obvious to parents maybe for the first time that it was possible to learn online. And then you saw that you know, from that we had increased adoption specifically for Edukoya that people are now increasingly aware that this is a viable option for their kids to learn. Um, particularly in Nigeria, um, we have an acute, in many parts of Africa, there's an acute shortage of teachers. Um, and we have one of the young, Africa has one of the youngest populations in the world, over 800 million people under 25. So there's an incredible opportunity to use technology to provide more accessibility and affordability in the education space. And I think COVID accelerated that. But companies like us in, in Edikoya are really now riding that wave and continue to build out what that future looks like. Mm -hmm. Bobs? Yeah, uh, so... 
We actually didn't start during COVID. Um, so we started, we launched in 2019 Q4, um, just before COVID. And um, during, I think it was early, early 2020, um, there was a bit of panic uh, because of COVID. Uh, we were actually trying to fundraise around that time as well. So, you know, at the time we always thought we had to travel um, to meet investors and whatnot, and we couldn't travel. So there was a lot of apprehension, um, you know, just generally. Um, but actually what happened was there, were a lot, there was a lot of, um, for those guys that were skeptical about, you know, digital and technology generally, especially within financial services, because there's a lot of, you know, trust barrier to, to overcome. It kind of left them with no other option if they wanted access to financial services because um, the traditional players um, weren't really set up for, you know, for, for that time. And we as a digital only bank were set up exactly for this. So it really um, helped us to um, accelerate um, the concept. It helped us to um, have more, I guess, um, tolerant customers um, willing to, to try new things just because that alternative wasn't there. And we really rode on that momentum um, till, till today. Um, and um, when it came to sort of fundraising, um, it was a challenge. Uh, our first institutional um, funds came in from, from Target Global. Um, I know there was, there was a lot of back and forth over Zoom, um, power cuts during, during um, IC sessions. Um, so it was, it was a very interesting time. But um, I guess it was kind of like setting, setting us up for this brave new world of how business would be done. Um, both on the sort of um, investor management side as well as um, the customer um, customer acquisition side, so it ended up being you know a red a, a silver lining um, for for our business and um, yeah as I said we're still riding that momentum till 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 today. You mentioned the, man, uh, mentioned the the power cuts. I think on one of the calls you had to run and refill the generator. <laughs> <laughs> get the liquidity back. I don't know where you were, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the challenges, actually. So it sounds like COVID uh, was, was kind of overall positive for both the businesses. And, and um, let's, uh, let, let's chat a little bit about kind of the difficulties of building uh, a business in, in emerging markets. Looking back, what, what were the things maybe that you didn't expect uh, that, that kind of uh, were challenging over the last couple of years? I think in terms of challenging, I, I mean, I'm a double-time founder, so I think typically in Africa and in many emerging markets, when we're starting out and building in a new sector, oftentimes there's a lot of skepticism, especially if you're building in the B2C space to see are people really going to, for example, e-commerce shop online, are people going to bank online, are people going to be willing to learn online? So a lot of the times it's introducing consumers to a new behavior and a new activity that they haven't um, used to or they, they haven't done before. But I think that that's where the incredible opportunity also comes um, to play because you're literally breaking ground in a new market where you are in many ways being able to, you know, going across uncharted territories. And in some cases you have very little to no competition, at least at the start till everyone figures out that it works. So beginning, it's really about just educating the customer, which often, you know, you need to do a lot more than you would need to do in more developed markets. I think then obviously we have the infrastructure challenges as well that come with working in emerging markets. So the internet isn't always as great, the power cuts. But those things are also incredible opportunities because for example, mobile internet in Africa is growing at an incredible pace. Um, so a lot of the times I think it's about thinking about the challenges and then working really, building into a solution about how you overcome them. So for example, at Edukoya, we know that you know, high-speed in uh, internet is not going to be accessible for especially users in remote areas. So we build our video streaming service in a way that it can work with really low latency and it can still be as efficient as, you know, uh, as someone who's using it in Europe. So you have to really understand the consumer sort of uh, mindset and understand the challenges they're working with and then build that into your product mm -hmm. for success. Yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of that. Um, in terms of, I think for financial services, it's, it's even more of a challenge um, just because there is a 
trust factor um, in when you look on the customer side uh, you're basically at least for us we're basically telling them to trust this faceless um, you know virtual financial institution um, who and these are a group of people that already have um, trust issues with physical brick and mortar so it just makes the the effort um, a lot more difficult um, so we had to do uh, a lot of sensitization a lot of education that's kind of like the first barrier that we had to cross the value proposition was a no-brainer it was accessible it was affordable but we really had to work hard um, on the trust on the trust issue um, the infrastructural deficits that um, honey mentioned also contributes to lack of trust again within financial services um, if you do a transaction um, and in today's world it's not instant or you don't get sort of instant response from from a customer service or customer experience um, it does um, dilute the trust so for us these are sort of huge challenges that we have to spend time every day um, really focusing on um, because for us the customer trust is the biggest asset that we have as a deposit taking financial institution. Um, on the regulatory side, because obviously we're a regulated entity, um, you know, our regulators are keen to, to support, but then there's also um, the whole concept of them being conservative. So striking the balance between a startup that's VC backed that needs to grow super fast, constantly looking for scale, um, to marry that with um, a regulator that um, is more conservative, you know, wants organic, um, slower growth, you know, because of the perceived risk um, of, um, of, of fast growth. So we have to be, we had to mature very quickly um, as a business, as individuals, really carrying the regulator along um, and just educating the regulators as well as the customers. Uh, so those are kind of like our sort of, I would say, major challenges. But um, as Honey said, it does bring opportunities as well. So over time, we've become sort of, I wouldn't say we're um, allies in terms of um, regulation, but we've become We've, we've developed a relationship um, which is sort of very beneficial for us. So we have a lot of access now um, to, to the regulator. We're able to um, propose a lot, of, a lot of things. So we're kind of seen as the sort of this, one of the poster child for, um, for FinTech um, in, in the space, in the region. Um, so that really helps us and it also helps us to sort of contribute to defining and, and shaping the policies um, of, um, of, of, of the space generally. Um, in terms of customers, uh, I think one of the things we did was to, you know, in carrying the customers along um, because of all these challenges, all these trust challenges, again, over time, we've managed to earn that trust. So even when we have issues with technology or downtimes, um, you know, because they know Kuda would always tell them ahead of time, we have we have some goodwill, you know, which is super important. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to that you know went into went into that. But at the at the end of it, um, I think it's you know it's just improved the relationships. Um, that we have with, with both sets, the co consumers and, and the regulators. Those are key, key stakeholders for us. I mean, you've obviously grown from, when we invested, I think, 40,000 accounts to 6.5 million in, uh, in three years. So you've clearly done a good job in kind of convincing uh, the customers that Gouda is a, is a trustworthy kind of alternative to, it, to the incumbent banks, right? Um, so you, you, you talked a little bit about kind of educating the, the market, but both of your companies are kind of not going necessarily after customers that in your case are kind of not banked or people that don't have education, but actually to unhappily banked or um, students that are kind of um, struggling. struggling, right? So would you say it makes a big difference what kind of business you, you start in, in emerging markets? Is it, um, is it easier to go after kind of 
un unhappy customers where the NPS is very low and, and, and you have a chance to kind of disrupt the, uh, the incumbents? Um, I think, I wouldn't say it's um, easier. Um, it's a different challenge. Um, I think one of the things that sort of people kind of potentially might underestimate is I think in emerging market, um, actually, you probably need more resources um, to, to get people on board uh, just because less, less has been done. Um, so when you talk about sort of the infrastructural deficit, in our case, I'll give an example, just delivering physical cards. Um, you know, in Europe, it's pretty um, seamless. You know, there's a mail system that works, um, good roads and whatnot. We have to think extra about that. Um, there's a whole department that, you know, kind of figures out the logistics of that, you know, the addressing and, and, and whatnot. Um, and then on the education side, you still you need to apply resources to um, ensure that that education piece um, is deep enough and is strong enough and you can sort of get people on board. So actually, even though we don't have as much access to, to funding in the region, um, it's ironic because we actually need you know, more funding um, in, in the region. Um, to unlock the huge um, opportunities um, that, that, that exist. So it's not necessarily easy or harder, but it's a different challenge, and it just, and it just like anywhere else, requires um, really strong domain knowledge and domain expertise to be able to unlock the value that, that, that is on ground. I think one of the things that I'd say as well is I think there is this misconception that sometimes consumers in emerging markets are radically different from consumers elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, they're quite similar. They want the same access to quality mm -hmm. education. Parents want the same thing for their kids to be able to get yeah. education and do well in school. They want the same access to great financial services. So in many ways, they are looking for convenience, ease, accessibility in the same way that many of us are. I think what is often different is that it's just super early stage in, in some cases, and so a lot more work has to go into sort of educating the consumer and building a really strong brand. I think that's one of the key things. And then the fact that they, in many cases, they don't have a lot of comparables, which is also a big opportunity, but it just means that for the early guys and for the guys who are starting or breaking out the industry, that we have to do a lot more work in the beginning to sort of educate the market. But I think once you do that work, then you have this huge opportunity there for the taking. And particularly in education, we'll see that in many African households, after food and shelter, education is the one sector where people are willing to sort of invest in for mm -hmm. their children because yep. for them, getting access to a good education is not in the same way here where it's you... The key. It's the yeah. key, right? Yeah. It's literally the difference between one generation lifting out of poverty mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and being able to do more um, and, and not having a great life. So mm -hmm. you'll see that parents will oftentimes after that, after the third thing, will invest in all this supplementary education to make their kids be able to have access and do better in school. Mm -hmm. um, I think around what you said around, I think it's also about just choosing the right business model. Um, in many cases, in, in case of CUDA, um, the, many people thought you couldn't directly build a digital license back, that you had to provide all these sort of ancillary services, but then they showed that it can be done. And the same with us in, in Edicoya, really providing an online learning alternative to go into an offline tutorial center. We're seeing consumers really start to take to that in a big way. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the opportunities as well. And I don't know if people know this in, in the audience, but Nigeria is a stat I find crazy, right? But it's 200 million people now, and I think it's, according to UN predictions, expected to grow to 400 million or even 500 million in the next 20, 30 years. So it will be the kind of third most populous country in the world. Which is, uh, Incredible. Uh, which is pretty crazy growth and, and you know, building, building a company in, in, in those markets um, can just mean you, you, know, you have a huge uh, uh, potential customer base, right? Um, and, and then on top, you, you're also serving um, kind of customers that are outside Africa uh, yeah, and, 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 and kind of going after the diaspora whilst paying, maybe you can talk a little bit about kind of also, the, the positive sides of building a, a business where you have the cost base in Africa, but actually you serve customers outside yeah. um, Nigeria. 
yeah, I think that Africans, and I think for me, when we think about the challenges, um, the opportunity is really about how do we educate Africans everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think Africans, no matter where they're located, often have unique needs. So in our case, um, we are spending a lot of time now educating Africans in diaspora, mm -hmm. um, and most of using teachers based in Nigeria. Um, so using Nigerian tutors who are very often highly qualified, um, have great access to internet as well, and are able to do it at a, a better cost price than you would performing a teacher in Europe. But they also have unique needs. So for example, we teach local language classes, uh, such as uh, Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, which are often just not available in Europe. So there's an incredible opportunity, not only serving Africans in Africa, but also Africans in the diaspora uh, as well. And you sort of think about that as sort of the, the full gamut of what it's like to just be serving an African immigrant um, mm -hmm. um, base. I think what's also interesting about that is just the population uh, growth in Africa means that it's just an incredible time to be building on the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, and also for other emerging markets, I think in many ways we get to pioneer uh, the future of what tutoring, what future of what education looks like. Um, in many cases, having had the opportunity to live both in Nigeria and in Europe, I think a lot of the things that we have in Nigeria are actually a lot more advanced financial services in many ways, because we have no option, we have to do it at a more accessible price point and we have to be really innovative. Mm -hmm. So it, it allows the technology and the solutions that we build to be really creative. And I think that as an entrepreneur and as a builder, um, building for Africans at this time with the growth in population is just an incredible opportunity to be at the forefront of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, focusing on Nigeria as a country, um, for me personally, I think you know, probably a bit biased, but I think Nigeria is uh, probably the most important economy in Africa. Um, so for us, we want to be category kings in Nigeria, and we believe that automatically that would um, propel us to be category kings across, across Africa. And, and we see it um, in sort of different examples. Um, I don't know if anybody listens to um, African music here, like Afrobeats. Um, most of the songs that you would hear, it's called Afrobeat, but it's probably, you know, it's Nigerian music, actually, <laughs> mostly. Controversial. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, the country sort of um, has a real movement um, and kind of carries Africa along with it. And, and we're really sort of leveraging on that as a business um, and leveraging on the, the huge population which kind of, you know, in a lot, of, and, and also, you know, having, trying to look for products to serve outside of Africa as well, so like the diaspora market, remittances and, and, and things like that, um, kind of just propels the brand um, and takes advantage of, of the population, not just within Africa, but outside of, of, of Africa as well. So, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. Um, it's huge opportunity from just, um, sort of consumer, uh, like a B2C um, customer perspective. Um, and it's something that um, I'm glad that, you know, I have that, you know, sort of domain knowledge and understanding of that customer base. And as a business, we're able to provide services that, you know, that really, really serve them. And also in terms of, um, you know, I think Ricardo, you mentioned a little bit about the cost, cost structure. Um, we do have to um, have, you know, expenses outside of, of, of Nigeria, um, but a lot of our expenses are also still within Nigeria. Um, and the reality is, um, it is, it is cheaper, um, so we can take advantage of sort of the low, the low cost, even in terms of things like, you know, marketing, um, when you do your, um, your SEOs and, and, and whatnot, um, it is slightly cheaper um, to acquire customers, um, but at the same time, we were able to leverage that um, to, to have the you know, similar revenue um, that you would have in, in more developed markets. There are, of course, lots of different challenges in terms of volatility of currencies and whatnot. We just had one recently um, in, in Nigeria, but um, long term, um, you know, the opportunity is to be able to build something of global standard, best, best standard at a, at a lower cost structure and still take advantage of sort of uh, huge potential um, revenue. 
it's obviously not homo homogenous, right? So kind of every every country has its own sure. uh, opportunities and challenges. Is it is it easier to go from Nigeria into other uh, African countries, or would you, if you could do it again, start in Ghana or uh, a smaller? Yeah, I, uh, I think. Yeah, I think Nigeria is quite complex, um, and I would say, from a business perspective, um, a little bit hostile if you're not familiar with the terrain. Um, I think other African countries are slightly easier and, you know, more friendly on a business um, level. Um, but I think, so if you can crack the complexities of a country like Nigeria, um, I think it's easier to move into, into other countries. I would definitely prefer to, to go first in Nigeria and then go outside, then go from outside to, into Nigeria. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would have to agree. I think sort of if you crack Nigeria, everywhere else feels a little bit like a walk in the park. <laughs> Uh, in comparison, it's just Nigeria is incredibly complex. The consumer is incredibly demanding. But if you manage to make pe enough people happy there, then typically, you can what you take, you can sort of do it. We, we've seen it at least in the case of online learning. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost uh, it's very different. But I think you know the Nigeria is a big jewel in Africa and, and many margin markets. So to win there is a good start to, to a good journey. And obviously, the best music comes from Nigeria. We learned obviously. Yeah. Obviously, <laughs> there we go. There's a fan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Before we finish, what, what do your companies look like in 10 years from now? What's your kind of, what's your vision? Well, I mean, for CUDA, we're building a, whilst it's uh, Africa-focused um, business, um, it's also a global business because we see Africans as, you know, we're, we're very global now and we're pretty much everywhere. So we're building a financial institution um, for every African on the planet. And um, I always joke that, you know, it's a niche product um, because of the um, sort of nicheness of the, of, 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 of the segment. But it's a nice niche to have, you know, we have like potentially two billion people um, to, to cater for. Um, so I would say in 10 years, uh, we, I want CUDA to be a global bank with, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of, 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 of customers um, all over the world. And um, yeah, just to be a household name everywhere, mm -hmm. really. Honey? Um, I think for me, uh, online education is going through an incredible transformation at the moment. And I think that I'm, at Acquire, our mission is really to be at the forefront of that and really look at how do we build the future of online tutoring for everyone. Um, so I think in 10 years, we really want to have achieved our mission. We want to have built like a global, uh, globally recognized education brand. So Edukoya being well known um, and being known for providing really affordable, accessible and engaging uh, education for the next generation. So I think if we've delivered on that, then I'd be pretty happy in, in 10 years. Great. So you, you heard it here. The uh, next wave of generational companies, multi-billion dollar businesses are currently being built uh, in, in, in Africa. So. Uh, we're obviously very um, happy and fortunate that we had a chance to invest and it's been kind of great working uh, with you guys um, and, and kind of looking forward to continue on the, on the journey. Big round of applause for Bob's and Honey. Thank you. Good. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. It's great to be here. Did you do anything? <laughs>